Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of UFOs in the Paranormal. Today's episode is called UFOs at the Drive-In. Imagine you're at a drive-in theater enjoying the movie with hundreds of other people when suddenly an unidentified flying object drops down out of the sky and hovers right above the screen itself. And then it starts flashing its lights or releasing smaller craft or darting around at amazing angles. This is the kind of encounter I'm talking about. This is not a random flyby of an object at night. Uh, in these cases, these objects are at very low levels, 50 feet perhaps, uh, right above the movie screen or on either side of it. Often these are very long lasting encounters, uh, five minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, or even the entire duration of the movie itself. Thirdly, and most importantly, these objects don't just hover there, they put on some type of display or show. Uh, it's clear they want to be seen. I think that's exactly what their agenda is. I, it appears that UFOs are using drive-in theaters as a method to announce their presence to humanity at large. I've documented more than a hundred cases of this kind. Uh, surprisingly, I did not find these in UFO books. Only a couple of them did I find there. Most of these come from local newspaper accounts or the archives of various UFO organizations. I think uh, most people do not know about these cases or this phenomenon. It certainly shocked me, uh, even though I have investigated several of these cases myself, I did not realize it was a thing. Uh, but it definitely is. UFOs are absolutely targeting theaters on purpose and showing themselves off to audiences uh, of hundreds of people. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Before I get into the actual cases, let me just give a little bit about uh, a little bit of background about drive-in theaters themselves for those who haven't been to one. Drive-in theaters were invented in the 1930s, but became very popular in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. In fact, they were America's number one pastime. Theater owners offered all kinds of extras to attract audiences. They had prize giveaways, petting zoos, balloon rides, pre-shows of all kinds. Um, many of them offered playgrounds or bleachers. Most of them had elaborate snack stands. Uh, and in fact, UF drive-ins not only attracted families, they were also very attractive to young lovers, young couples. Uh, and uh, many theater owners uh, were actually <laughs> would hire police officers who would walk between the aisles with flashlights to make sure no one in the cars were behaving, quote, inappropriately. At any rate, by the 1980s, Drive-in theaters declined dramatically. Before, there had been thousands of them. Uh, today, there are only a few hundred due to the invention of VCR and digital entertainment. But they're still hanging on, and in fact, they're making a comeback. And of the hundred cases that I was able to document, uh, some have occurred in recent times. So, this is a very interesting phenomena that I don't think most people know about and what I'd like to do is take you on a little chronological journey through some of the more interesting cases and show you how UFOs are using drive-in theaters as a method to announce their presence to humanity at large and sort of sliding under the radar and not causing huge waves in society. So many, many cases. And the earliest one I could find occurred on July 22nd, 1950 at the Starlight Theater in Spartanburg, North Carolina. The main witness was a journalist by the name of Vernon Gwynn, who with his wife witnessed a dirigible shaped object uh, glide by the theater. And then it returned a second time. And when it came back a third time, it was clear that it was targeting the theater itself. And it came back a fourth time, at which time it was very low and he got a good view at it. Uh, he and his wife jumped out of the car. They alerted other people at the theater who also saw it and all agreed that it was an unexplained object 
uh, cigar-shaped, had a silvery white appearance with a rounded bottom, and was totally silent. What's very interesting is uh, Vernon Gwynn reported his case to the Air Force. It was routed to Project Blue Book, and it went from Blue Book, get this, straight to the very head of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And in fact, it was sent by Blue Book to Colonel John Meads, who was the commanding officer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which, by the way, is sort of UFO central, where our government studies foreign technology, and Wright-Patterson has been deeply implicated in the UFO phenomenon. I have many cases I want to share with you, so I'm going to go through some of them kind of quickly and spend more attention on some of the more interesting cases. Uh, the 1950s was extremely active for cases of this kind. Uh, the next case I could find also occurred in 1950 at the Fair Park Drive-In. This is in Montgomery County, Alabama. The main witness was Sheriff Aubrey Yates, who was with his wife at the theater when they saw this object drop down out of the sky and hover, quote, right above the screen where it stayed for the next 15 minutes before suddenly darting off straight upward. Uh, the witness later found out that a number of people had reported this sighting and that the air local airport had also received calls. Uh, and uh, it appears that these UFOs are s sort of using drive-in theaters and touring the country, much like a musician perhaps, or an author doing a book tour and are just showing themselves off at one theater after another. The next case I could find was October 24, 1950, in Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Skyway Drive-In, when a security chief by the name of William B. Fry and his family observed a glowing object. It had beautiful colored lights, red, green, blue, and orange, and it moved back and forth above the theater for 37 minutes before finally moving away. So again, we see this display type behavior. Another case from Montgomery, Alabama was on July 8, 1951 at the Fairview Drive-In. Uh, a military officer uh, from Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, which was nearby saw a saucer-shaped object which he estimates was about 50 maybe 75 feet wide glowing bright blue and it was a thousand feet high it approached the theater and was kind of wobbling and floating and then suddenly darted away that case uh, it was one of the more brief types of cases i would call really the 1950s the pre-show because the cases were interesting, but they soon became far more dramatic in the 60s and 70s. Uh, next case I'd like to talk about occurred on April 16, 1952, at the Yuma Drive-In in Yuma, Arizona. The main witness was Sally Ann Diggs and her boyfriend, who was a lieutenant, Gerald Williams and they were at the theater on a date when this classic flying saucer showed up. It had yellow and red lights and uh, was clearly metallic, totally silent, and it just came right up to the theater and went right by it very slowly and obviously in full view. Uh, they ended up calling the local Air Force Base, uh, who sent over a uh, public information officer to sort of debunk the case and tried to make it look like the witnesses had hallucinated the event. Unfortunately, he couldn't go too far because it turned out that Sally Ann, Ann Diggs' father uh, was Colonel Edward Diggs, who was just about to assume command of Yuma Air Force Base. Uh, but at any rate, they tried to debunk it as much as they could with Sally Ann Diggs' father uh, being present during the questioning. What's very interesting about this case is only a, uh, 14 days later, or 11 days later, actually, there was another sighting over the drive-in theater, and it involved a number of 
glowing red discs that were spinning and rotating and darting by the theater. Uh, they ended up seeing a total of seven or eight of these things, which would dart down and then dart back upwards. Again, we had that weird kind of display type behavior. Another case from the 1950s, July 17th, 1952, the Starlight Drive-In in Rapid City, South Dakota. The main witnesses were Sergeant Gordon Anderson and his girlfriend, Lee Gerber. Uh, they both observed two V-shaped objects, or two V-shaped formations, I should say, of orange discs move over the theater. There were 24 objects in total, and uh, they reported uh, the sighting to their superiors at the nearby Air Force Base, who should have been able to see these objects because the, they was not far away. But the officials at the Air Force Base uh, said that they had no knowledge of these objects. Uh, researcher Lauren Gross, who researched this case, was collecting UFO reports, and he writes, and I quote, one would think that airbase officials would be well aware of two formations of aircraft flying over the field at 10 in the evening. Apparently, no such thing took place, so that explanation was not suggested. Uh, so many cases from the 1950s. Here's another one on July 22, 1952, at the Fresh Pond Drive-In Theater in Newton, Massachusetts. A uh, gentleman was at the theater, his name was Nicholas Jacobson, and he saw four or five bright objects approaching. And as they always do, this was in perfect view of the, his eye line, right above the screen itself. And as these objects approached the theater, they suddenly slowed down, turned sharply, and zoomed straight upwards. As the witness Nicholas Jacobson says, it's a peculiar thing to see. You can hardly believe it when it's happening. But that once again, there we have that weird sort of acrobatic type behavior when these objects approach the theaters. Uh, July 30th, 1952, the Sedalia Drive-In in Sedalia, Missouri. Numerous people called the local newspaper to report this red glowing disc-like object which was hovering in a vertical position and passing over the theater. It remained in view for about seven minutes. Uh, that case actually did get into the newspapers and newspaper reporters wrote, feature attraction at the drive-in is not a movie. Uh, again, these are Early cases may seem dramatic, but they're truly not. Uh, soon, activity would ramp up in an uh, amazing fashion. Uh, but in the 1950s, again, it's just the pre-show. <laughs> um, here's a really excellent case, though, which occurred at the Terrace Drive-In in Bakersfield, California. On August 12th, 1952, uh, Lieutenant Jenkins was at the Terrace Drive-In and uh, he and about 600 other people, uh, the theater had space for 650 cars, saw this cigar-shaped object drop down out of the sky without any warning, and it hovered right above the screen itself. At this point, it flashed its lights at the audience, or perhaps uh, they were portholes, as some people thought. At any rate, everyone agreed that this was a metallic object right above the screen, uh, it was highly visible and uh, totally silent and so hovered there for just a few moments before darting off like a bullet uh, in the other direction. What's interesting about this case is Lieutenant Jenkins called the local sheriff's office. Sheriff Leroy Hatfield answered the call and took down a description, hung up the phone, and the phone rang again. It was another person uh, who had seen a UFO at the theater and after receiving two more calls and the phone kept ringing, uh, Sheriff Leroy Hatfield went down to the theater itself and interviewed more than 30 people uh, who had seen this object. <clears throat> there was more than 100 people still there talking about it. 
And after interviewing like 30 people, he said, that's enough. I've got a clear description of what happened. And he wrote up a report and sent it to the local Air Force Base. It was routed to Project Blue Book at Edwards Air Force Base. Here's where it gets really interesting. This report, which was marked action, was sent the very next day to the Air Technical Intelligence Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The, the ATIC took cases that bypassed Blue Book because of matters of national security. What's also interesting is this report was also sent to Ent Air Force Base in Colorado, where we track all air traffic, and also to the very highest level of government, the Director of Intelligence at Washington, D.C. So once again, we see that these cases are being reported to very high levels of government. Next case I'd like to talk about uh, took place also in 1952 on August 13th, 1952 at the Rodeo Drive-In Theater in Tucson, Arizona. The main witness is Captain Stanley Thompson, who was an engineer at Edwards Air Force Base, actually, and was visiting with his family when a group of lights passed over the theater. In this case, they were quite high up, about a thousand feet, uh, and he couldn't tell whether these were, you know, a thousand feet high and smaller objects, or maybe even higher and much larger. But this is a case that might qualify as a random flyby because it wasn't super low level and it didn't put on any type of display type behavior. So some of these cases, it does seem that luck is playing a factor, but in most cases, no, theaters are being directly targeted and some sort of a show is put on, as we'll see when we get to some of the more dramatic cases in just a, just a, just a bit. So the next case took place on August 15, 1952 at the Family Drive-In Theater in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, there was an Air Force lieutenant, his wife, and two children saw this reddish glowing uh, light, and it was much larger than a star, when suddenly it drops down over the theater, makes a sharp 90-degree turn, and zips away. Uh, so... I started to wonder what is going on here in these cases. Why are they doing this? Perhaps they're just curious about the movie. Could they be watching the movie? Are they interested in these huge bright screens and these very powerful beams of light? Or maybe they're drawn towards these huge parking lots filled with cars with people sitting in them. Uh, at this point, I still wasn't, wasn't quite sure what was going on here. But as I collected more cases, it became pretty apparent. Uh, that there was an agenda on the ET's part to announce their presence. Here's another case which took place at the Corral Drive-In in Lubbock, Texas in August 1952 when Frank Hoenig and his wife and others at the theater saw spots of light moving at high speed above the theater. This does seem to be sort of a random flyby, but what's really interesting is while this was hovering over the outdoor theater, People in the indoor theater in Lubbock, Texas, were watching the movie, quote, A Thing from Another World. So while people were watching a movie about a thing from another world in the indoor theater, people in the outdoor theater were, were actually watching A Thing from Another World. Uh, so every couple of months, it seems, uh, UFOs would find another theater to drop down and put a display over the next case I could find occurred on September 9th, 1952, at the Yucca Drive-In in, in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, Eddie Bowman was with a bunch of other people when they all saw this bright, bright light zoom by. And as it reached the theater, suddenly it dropped down to me, but instead of actually landing, it darted upwards and away. As uh, the main witness, Eddie Bowman, says, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it, but I saw it, and the management admitted it was not on the regular program. So as we go on, the cases do become much more dramatic. Uh, the next case I'd like to talk about occurred on July 17th, 1954. Uh, the main witness was just a kid at the time, a little boy by the name of Peter, and he was 
at a, a drive-in theater, the Skyline Drive-in Theater, outside of St. Louis, Missouri, with his mom and his brother. Uh, they were watching the movie when suddenly this bright, bright object showed up. It was bright red, oval-shaped, and was hovering not above the screen in this case, but next to the parking lot. It was so bright it cast an eerie red light over the entire audience. Everybody stopped watching the movie and jumped out of their cars and were staring at this thing in awe. There was no real panic. Everyone was just completely awestruck and amazed. And uh, Peter and the others watched this thing for about uh, five minutes or so. At some point, people started to walk towards this thing, at which point it st started to move away slowly and then darted off like a bullet. Uh, it turns out that Peter's father also saw this object. He worked in the local airport tower and was viewing the object with, along with other people using binoculars. Well, Peter came from a military family. He had several Air Force pilots in his family, and he had already had a strong interest in aircraft of all kinds. And this incident instilled within him a deep interest in UFOs. And uh, he wasn't a UFO investigator, but kept uh, in touch with uh, the UFO phenomena and did know several prominent investigators. And in fact, he was friends with the guy who started the organization, the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork. Uh, the gentleman's name was Bob Gribble, Robert Gribble. And uh, Robert Gribble one day approached Peter and said, you know what, I'm going to have to give up New Fork. It's just too much work for me. I can't run it anymore. Uh, and Peter, who, you know, as an adult at this time, offered to take it over. And uh, he did. And that's how Peter Davenport became the director of New Fork. It was because of this sighting he had as a little boy at the uh, theater in St. Louis, Missouri, at the Skyline Theater in St. Louis, Missouri. So it's an interesting case and shows how these kinds of uh, displays can profoundly influence people even years afterwards. Another real interesting case occurred on August 21st, 1954 at the Lakeshore Drive-In in Denver, Colorado, when an Air Force pilot who was at the theater saw more than a dozen red lights. Uh, this does appear that they were just flying by the theater, uh, but what's interesting is this officer reported to the uh, Air Force, and he got a response back from a gentleman by the name of Chester A. Cummings from the OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, who showed a strong interest in his report uh, because these objects were clocked at moving several thousands of miles per hour. Uh, there are so many cases. Uh, uh, another case I want to talk about occurred in 1956 at the Florence Drive-In. This was on September 9, 1956, and as the newspaper article said, the best show was not on the screen, but in the dark sky. And what happened was uh, a plane was flying over the theater, and right behind the plane, all the audience members could see a UFO following it. And as it's following this plane, it suddenly darts away. And then when another plane started to fly over the theater, it came zooming back and followed it again. As one of the witnesses, Jack Julie, says, it was the most unusual thing I've ever seen. So again, it appears that they want to be seen. I mean, for example, here's another amazing case which occurred at the Piedmont Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. This was on September 26, 1957, when dozens of people at the theater saw this quick-moving object. One of the witnesses, Walter Marks, uh, says that this object suddenly stopped over the theater and sent down a beam of light, and then it darted away. Uh, so again, it clearly wants to be seen. What's interesting about this case is only uh, hours earlier, 
a UFO, perhaps the same one, had been seen twice over the St. Agnes College, uh, where it also put on a low-level display. So it went from a schoolyard uh, right over to a movie theater. So this is again why I think they're trying to announce their presence. Another interesting case occurred in uh, 1957, and this was at the three-way drive-in at the junctions of Highway 8, 78, and 191. This is in Clifton, Arizona, November 3, 1957. Uh, the witnesses were Larry Parsons and Mary Chapman, and they described this disc-shaped silver object which caught everyone's attention as it moved very quickly overhead. Uh, now, this is not far from the town of Morenci, which has a copper smelting plant, which has attracted a number of sightings. And I thought, hmm, perhaps that's what's going on in this case, because uh, that's something I did look for. Perhaps, you know, it's Air Force bases, or is there anything around these driving theaters that is attracting these UFOs? And in a few cases, perhaps, yes. But no, in most cases, drive-in theaters are in relatively rural locations uh, outside of major city centers. And uh, that is where the UFOs show up. And for that matter, there are a few cases of drive-ins in heavily densely populated areas. And the UFO still stops over the theater itself. So here is another good example, November 6th, 1957, the King Center Twin Drive-In Theater. Grace Lester and many others saw an extremely bright light uh, and it appeared to be zigzagging across the sky. They reported it to the local newspaper and it turned out that many other people saw it, including at least six police officers. And uh, this could you know, this was a brief sighting, so, but uh, fairly low level and, once again, widely viewed. Uh, I'm not sure if it was specifically targeting the theater in this case because so many other people saw it, but it's clear that it did want to be seen. But things were about to ramp up. I mean, once again, this was the pre-show, uh, but now things were really starting to get very interesting. Uh, at the for example, the next case, August 18th, 1959, at the Waterford Drive-In in Waterford, Michigan. Wanda Burl and her husband Kenneth were watching the movie Alias Jesse James and All Mine to Give, a double feature, when suddenly two objects dropped down out of the sky and hovered at a very low level over the theater. Uh, they remained for at least 10 minutes, long enough for people to get out of their cars and watch these objects as they put on a display, darting around, streaking away, coming back towards them, making U-turns. As uh, the witness says, as Wanda says, we were agog. It was unbelievable. There was a human intelligence about the whole thing, or superhuman. Uh, they reported it to the local newspaper, the Pontiac Press, who wrote the headline, Flying Discs Seen in the Area, Give Bonus Show at Drive-In. So that is a good, clear example of sort of your standard uh, UFO drive-in theater encounter. Next case I'd like to talk about took place at the Tillicum Theater in Victoria, Canada. This is one of very few cases that took place outside of the United States. This occurred in 1961 when two objects appeared overhead and started to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And soon they were so bright that the street lights went out and people were not able to watch the movie. So instead, they just watched these objects. They got out of their cars as and just watch this thing for the next 30 minutes as it hovered there in the sky. And after 30 minutes, these objects started to put on a show. This is when the show began. For the next 10 or 15 minutes, one of the objects darted back and forth at very high speeds uh, in an obvious display. Um, no one was watching the movie. As one witness said, there was no show to watch but that one. So it's 
clear that I think uh, UFOs know that we're there to be entertained. And they're like, oh, you want to see a show? <laughs> Watch this. Uh, in fact, there was one theater, the Brackley Drive-In Theater in Charlottetown on Prince Edward Island in Canada, uh, where a UFO came so often throughout the late 1960s that the owners actually advertised, put in their advertisement for the theater, want to see a UFO come to the local Brackley Drive-In Theater. So this is when I started to realize what's going on here. And here was the case that actually made me decide that this was an intentional display put on by the ETs in an attempt to announce their presence to a large group of people. Uh, this next case occurred on in May of 1963. The main researcher is George Fawcett. He's a a uh, very well-known pioneering UFO researcher, highly respected. And this took place at the Wellington Circle Twin Theater in Medford, Massachusetts. And according to the witnesses, uh, suddenly two disc-like objects showed up and hovered side by side next to the parking lot. And a few minutes later, Two more discs showed up and slipped down beneath the original two, which moved upwards. And they hovered there for a few minutes when suddenly two more objects came, followed by two more after that. So now we have eight discs total, a fleet, <laughs> really, of uh, these U UFOs, these glowing discs. And each are in two columns of four each. And this is when the show kind of began. The objects had uh, finally all arrived and they hovered there for just a few moments when for the next 45 minutes, these objects started to move in sort of a rotating musical chairs fashion, dancing around the sky in these rotating patterns uh, for 45 minutes. So this was when I realized, okay, they clearly want to be seen. They are putting on a show for the audience. Uh, it's hard to escape this conclusion when there are so many cases like this. And uh, that's a very long-lasting case, 45 minutes. Uh, so I don't think they're watching the movie. I'm not sure that they're just curious uh, about what the movie is or why the audience is there. Because why then would they move in this weird fashion, behave in a way that makes it clear they want to be seen. Another amazing case occurred at the Southside Drive-In Theater. This was in Fort Worth, Texas in 1963. The movie was Tom Jones, <laughs> and suddenly the witnesses were watching the movie when, without warning, this object rises up from directly behind the screen itself. And it hovers for a few moments, and then a second object rises up. And then instantly both objects dart away. Dart away. And uh, it was very obvious to the witness. Uh, and what they, their comment was that the movie actually was not very good, and the sighting itself was a lot more interesting than the movie. So here's a, another amazing case that I'd really like to share. So far, all of these cases have been mostly what I would call close encounters of the first kind, a simple sighting. Uh, close encounters of the second kind affect the physical environment. Close encounters of the third kind are, are when people see entities are taken on board. Uh, and some of these cases are not uh, simple sightings. They would qualify as close encounters of the second or third kind. For example, what happened at the Richland Driving Theater in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1963. The movie pre-show had just begun when everybody heard this very loud crackling sound and the speakers went dead. Uh, shortly after the speakers went dead, the screen itself went dead. And then all the cars had uh, that were still entering the theater died <laughs> and no electricity worked and this is when this huge object showed up. As the witness reports, 
and I'm quoting, people got out of their cars and as we looked up, there was an object the size of a football field coming across the sky. It was shaped like a sphere, almost like a stealth, but five times as big. There was a dome on its bottom that was illuminated and seemed to rotate. There were greenish-blue flames coming off the edges, and it went right down the skyline. Uh, this case was actually reported to New Fork, run by Peter Davenport, uh, and uh, one of many cases that I did actually find uh, at the National UFO Reporting Center. Here's another incredible case, uh, which really <laughs> shows how dramatic uh, these cases can get. This occurred on June 29, 1964, to an anonymous witness at a drive-in theater in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know the name of the theater, uh, but in this case, uh, the witness was a young kid. He was there with his family and his cousins, and they were sitting on the bleachers, which were filled with a bunch of kids, watching the movie, when one of the kids shouts out, Hey, look, there's a UFO! And the main witness, who I call Trent, looks up and sees this metallic saucer moving over the tree line several hundred yards away alongside the theater, and then it disappears off into the distance behind some trees. And suddenly everyone just seemed to forget about it and continued to watch the movie, and which that in itself is kind of strange, but we'll see that turns up. Amnesia does turn up in some of these cases. Uh, but suddenly this UFO returned. The, the kid shouts out, Hey, look, there it is again! And this time the UFO was not off in the distance. It was coming directly towards them at a very low altitude, 50, 100 feet high. It was a metallic saucer with colored lights on it, and it was making a beeline for the theater. And in a matter of less than a minute, it was right over the theater and actually went right over the bleachers uh, where all the kids were, and, the, and Trent, the main witness, and every child on the bleachers scattered in panic and went running to, for their cars. Uh, Trent had lost track of where his mom was parked, and so he and his cousin ran to the snack stand and hid there for a few minutes and watched this panic ensue over the, the, the theater. And... Uh, after a few moments, he finally located his mom, who was waving frantically at him, and he crept out from the snack stand and looked up and was shocked to see that this object was hovering directly overhead. It was very low level and uh, about 30 feet in diameter, he estimates. And at this time, people were screeching out of the theater, just driving away. And he ran, got to uh, his... Uh, parents and got in the car and they screeched off. It's a very dramatic encounter which shows that in some cases these low-level sightings will actually cause a panic. Uh, now here's another very interesting case which comes from researcher Brian Vike. This occurred at the Studio Drive-In in Culver City, California in 1965. And the intermission for the movie had just begun when a huge disc with lights around the edge suddenly appeared to hover above the screen. And as the witness says, it was fairly low, but high enough that we had to bend our heads down to see it through the front windshield. My husband and I were pointing and wondering when I looked around and saw others in cars nearby also looking and pointing. It stayed for about two minutes and then banked off for about two or three seconds before just disappearing. What's interesting about this case is uh, the witness who reported this was six months pregnant at the time and didn't notice any strange effects until uh, after her pregnancy when she said her she would uh, hold, be holding her child and she could feel a strange sort of electric buzzing sensation coming from her child's skin. And when she felt that, her first thought was that perhaps the UFO had, quote, beamed something into my stomach, uh, which may sound strange, but there is, in fact, a very strong interest in UFOs, on the UFO's part, in reproduction. 
and many, many cases do involve pregnant women. So perhaps there is a connection there in this particular case. Uh, here's another example of how UFOs will put on a show at a drive-in theater. This was at the Conway Drive-In Theater in Conway, Arkansas in 1965. The witnesses were watching the movie Cat Baloo when three lights appeared above and to the right of the screen. And one of these objects uh, started to fly figure eights around the other two. Then the other two flew off and the last object stayed for about an hour. And finally, the, the, uh, another object returned and parked right next to the first one and the objects remained for the entire duration of the movie. So perhaps that, in that case they were watching the movie. Hard to say. One of my favorite cases occurred in the mid-1960s in Mentor, Ohio. Uh, this is a very interesting case. Uh, it, occur, it involves this cigar-shaped object which hovered over the theater for about a half an hour. And it was there for so long that uh, the owners turned off the movie. Some people in the audience were getting nervous about this UFO and afraid that it might see them. And so they turned off the movie, which nobody was watching anyway. Everyone's attention was on this huge cigar-shaped object that was ho hovering at a very low level over the theater parking lot. So after watching it for about a half an hour, this is when the show began. This cigar-shaped object, which was hovering in a horizontal position, turned vertical, assumed a vertical position, and one by one started to release objects. First two, then four, then six, and finally it released a total of ten glowing disc-shaped objects, which started to dance around <laughs> for a period of minutes, uh, 15 minutes or so, darting at right angles, hovering, zooming back and forth, putting on an obvious display. And then suddenly they lined up like obedient school children and one by one zipped back inside the cigar-shaped mother ship. The cigar-shaped ship then assumed a horizontal position and moved off. So that was the case that for me really cemented the theory that these objects are intentionally showing off and putting on a display of some kind in an apparent attempt to announce their presence to a large group of people. Here's another very interesting case which comes from researcher Leonard Stringfield. Uh, this occurred at a drive-in in Dallas, Texas on September 25, 1966 when Mrs. Farah saw a blue light darting back and forth over the theater. After watching it dart back and forth several times, this object suddenly divided into four separate lights, which started vanishing and reappearing at different locations. Uh, after uh, this all occurred, the witness actually called the local airport who denied any knowledge of this incident, and she was insistent on reporting it and finally was able to locate researcher Leonard Stringfield who agreed to take a report. And now we move to perhaps uh, one of my top three cases in this book. I was able to interview this witness firsthand. His name is Pat Mitchell and this occurred in South Hutchinson, Kansas at the South Hutch Theater. Uh, this was probably the summer of 1966, approximately. He's not entirely sure of the date. He was around 18, 19, maybe 20 years old when he and his friend decided that they were going to go to the South Hutch Theater to see the latest James Bond movie. Uh, and uh, they got there early. They got their popcorn. They parked in the center of the parking lot, got a really good seat up close, and they attached their little detachable speaker onto their windshield and uh, waited for the show to begin. And the movie was great. It was James Bond. It was very exciting. When suddenly Pat's friend uh, shouts out, Hey, Pat, look, do you see that? Do you see that light? 
And Pat did see it because it had appeared right above the screen, right in eye view, and was off in the distance. And it was some distance away at this point, just a little dot of light in the sky, but quickly approaching. And it ap approached directly for the theater. And as it got closer and closer, they could see that this was a disc-shaped object. And finally, it was right next to the theater itself, right next to the screen, and it parked there below the level of the screen, uh, which was a large screen, by the way. This was a screen that was 50 feet high, 120 feet across. And Pat estimates that this metallic saucer was probably about 40 feet, nearly half the length of the screen. Uh, it was very big, and it was below the level of the screen itself. It was in full view of the entire audience of hundreds of people, and there was no panic. Everyone just stared in awe. Some people got out of their cars and looked at this thing. Pat says that this object had colored lights on it. It was beautiful. Uh, there were red lights, yellow lights, blue, green, which were sort of uh, blinking around the circumference, the perimeter. And this object just parked there for about five minutes while everyone just stared at it when suddenly it began to move. And this darn thing moved behind the screen itself. Uh, Pat estimates maybe 10 feet behind it. Uh, once it was behind it, it disappeared, of course, from view for just a moment and then came out the other side, the left side, it rose up uh, a little bit, maybe 100 feet or so, and hovered there for another five minutes or so. Everyone stared at it and watched it, totally silent. And this thing then starts to move again. It makes one full revolution around the entire theater, almost as if to make sure everyone can see it or rounding everyone up. And then it starts to head down the highway, right above the highway at about 20 miles per hour. Nobody was watching the movie at this point, and instead, everyone started screeching out of the theater to follow this object. Pat and his friend joined a convoy, a convoy of some 20 to 40 cars uh, traveling down the highway following this object for about six miles until it finally stopped and moved off the highway a little bit and moved up a little bit and hovered again for another five minutes. Next five minutes, everyone got out of their car, blocking the highway and just stared up at this thing. By this point, everyone was absolutely convinced that they were seeing a genuine flying saucer, a UFO. And after five minutes or so, this object darts straight upwards. It's a little dot of light in the sky and it's gone. Uh, this sighting was the talk of the town for weeks. Uh, several people said that they were going to report it to the newspaper, which they apparently did. Uh, Pat had actually done some photography work for the local newspaper, and he was excited to read the story in the newspaper, but it, when he checked the next day, there was no story, and no story appeared the next day after that. So he went with his friend uh, into the newspaper office and asked them about it and reported his sighting. And uh, the journalists that he talked to played dumb, he says. They acted like they didn't know about the sighting and they said that they were not interested in doing a story on it. And Pat knew that other people had already gone there and reported the sighting, so that seemed to be a lie. And this is when rumors started flying around that perhaps the military showed up and uh, stopped the story from being published. Hard to say, but it, as uh, we'll see, it's not the only case where the military has apparently showed up. It's a truly incredible case, and I think it's very obvious that it's putting on a display of some kind. Here's another very bizarre case, uh, which wasn't widely viewed, but I included it because it does seem to have a connection to a drive-in theater. This occurred in 1966 at, in Bogalusa, Louisiana. Uh, the main witness is a college student who had returned home. Uh, her family actually owned this drive-in theater. They owned and operated it. And uh, one evening, the student returns home, and the movie is already in progress. 
Uh, so she decided that she was going to go behind the theater itself, which was a very rural area, and do a little night hunting. And she went out there with her rifle and her headlamp and was hiking behind the theater. She could see the movie playing. She could see the cars. She could see the projection booth. She knew her parents were there. She was just maybe a quarter mile away from it when she comes over a small rise and sees this UFO. It's a classic flying saucer. It's got huge two-foot wide windows in front. Uh, it's illuminated with bright orange light. It's totally silent and hovering maybe 50 feet up and 100 feet away from her. Uh, she, she does not have her headlamp turned on at this point, so she's hidden. Who's ever inside this object apparently doesn't see her, but she can see figures, human-looking figures as far as she can tell, moving around inside. They were wearing uniforms of some kind, uh, and she assumed that these guys must be Air Force uh, because they looked human as far as she could tell. The problem was they were inside a classic flying saucer which was totally silent. Uh, some of them were operating the control panels and others were at the front near the windows and appeared to be watching the movie. So the student, the witness, watched this for about 15 minutes and deciding that these were probably Air Force personnel, uh, she decided she was going to play a joke on them and she uh, stood up and shined her lamp, her headlight, uh, into this UFO. And the reaction was instantaneous. The yellow light inside the craft turned to red, and the craft instantly made a loud humming noise, very much like the electric transformer they used to power their theater, and it took off. It put on a red light and a green light on one side and moved off into the distance. Uh, the student was a long-distance runner. She was taking running in track in college, so she immediately took off running to the projection booth where her parents were working. She found her father there, and she quickly pointed out the object, which was still visible in the sky, and asked him what he thought it was. And he looked at it and said, it looks like a plane. And she said, no, it couldn't be a plane. <laughs> it was totally silent. It was saucer-shaped. It was hovering about 50 feet up the ground right behind the theater. And he kind of looked at her like she was crazy, and she didn't talk about it to anyone after that for years, but did finally report the case to MUFON. It's her conclusion that she probably saw Air Force personnel in some sort of test craft, but I'm wondering if perhaps this was just human-looking ETs, which we do hear reports of, because why would the Air Force be testing their UFO right next to a drive-in theater and would they really be watching a drive-in movie? <laughs> I don't know. It's, of course, impossible to say for sure, but it's certainly a very interesting case involving humanoids. Uh, okay, here's another case from 1967. This occurred at the Highland Drive-In Theater in Salt Lake City, Utah. A silver metallic disc-shaped craft appeared and was moving back and forth in front of the mountains. And uh, the witness who reported it said that everyone could, was clearly seeing this, everyone was looking at it, but no one talked about it, no one said anything, no one even seemed to really react. And after it finally left, everyone just returned to the movie as if it had never been there. And she thought, could they have been in shock? What's going on here? <gasps> But as we'll see in some of these cases, people will actually forget that they saw the UFO or do not react in the way you'd think they would. Uh, here's another very interesting case which was reported to Project Blue Book. This occurred at an unnamed drive-in in Duluth, Minnesota, probably the Skyline Theater, uh, but the theater was not actually named, so I can't be sure. The main witness is Lieutenant Robert T. Rogers, who is the Director of Air Defense Artillery for the 29th Air Division. So a good witness, a trained observer, and he saw a disc-shaped object appear and start darting around above the theater at an elevation of a few thousand feet, he estimates. 
Uh, he reported his sighting to his superiors, and his report was rooted to Project Blue Book. Uh, an officer from Project Blue Book, Lieutenant William B. Stocker, prepared a report and sent it to his superiors at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he wrote, and I'm quoting, The observer is known by this officer and is reliable. The light did not resemble aircraft. Balloons do not go against the wind. Satellites do not fly under clouds. And meteors do not stay in the sky for minutes or change course. Ball lightning is unlikely according to the weather officer. Sighting is unexplained. His Blue Book superiors, however, disagreed. They refused to mark this sighting unidentified and ordered him to look more deeply into the possibility that this could have been a balloon, <laughs> which it clearly wasn't. But this just shows how Project Blue Book was not a true objective investigative body, but was in fact a operation, a device uh, used by the Air Force to debunk this phenomena using our own tax dollars. Several of these cases uh, at drive-in theaters were reported to Project Blue Book and not one of them was labeled unidentified. Next case that I'd like to cover occurred on August 12th, 1969 at the Foothill Drive-In in Azusa, California. The movie was How the West Was Won and War Wagon, and this object appeared right above the movie screen and then suddenly darted off. Uh, in this case, it was so fast that no one else at the theater seemed to notice it, uh, except for the people in at least one car. And uh, the mother refused to talk about it, and uh, the daughter was the one who reported this sighting. Another interesting case occurred in 1970 at the South Side Drive-In in, in Youngstown, Ohio, when an object appeared over the theater and started dar darting upwards and downwards, uh, left to right, moving back and forth, going in all kinds of different directions. Everyone exited their car as this object put on a dramatic show for about five minutes or so and then finally darted away. Uh, there was an estimated 200 witnesses, and uh, after it finally left, everyone just broke out into this incredibly loud conversation discussing what they saw, and everyone agreed that it was a genuine UFO. Another case I'd really love to discuss is one that I investigated personally. The main witness is Claudia Blasios, uh, she worked at my office where I worked as a bookkeeper and doing data entry. And this case occurred years earlier in 1972 when she was just a little girl. She was at the Paramount Drive-In Theater in Paramount, California with her parents and her little sister. And suddenly Claudia noticed that people were running by her car, dropping the popcorn, dropping their drinks, jumping into their cars and screeching off. She looked at her parents. Her parents were both entranced, like hypnotized. Their mouths were hanging open and they were staring to the right of the screen. And Claudia, who had not been paying attention, looked outside and got a huge shock. There was a giant flying saucer hovering right next to the right of the screen, below the screen level, and it was just sitting there. She said it was as if it was watching us watch the movie. It was bright silver, like a silver spoon, she said. It had colored lights on it. It wasn't completely silent. It was very quiet, but it was making sort of a whooshing noise. And everyone was just in a complete panic, uh, jumping into their cars and screeching off. Claudia and her family, however, were just stayed in their car and stared at this thing. And here's where it gets weird. She doesn't remember what happened next. She doesn't remember this object leaving. They don't remember going home that evening. They don't remember really anything else about it. And in fact, didn't talk about it at all. They completely forgot. And it wasn't until some years later, uh, when she was 
a young adult, when she was listening to the radio with her mom, they were in the kitchen when someone came on the radio and started to describe his UFO sighting at the Paramount Drive-In Theater. And as he's describing it, Claudia realized that he was describing exactly what they saw. So this is one of just a few cases in which there is independent corroboration from multiple uh, witnesses. And what's really interesting is Claudia and her mom and uh, the other family members completely forgot about this. They had no memory of it. And in fact, Claudia said, Mom, we were there, weren't we? And her mom's like, yeah, that was strange. I do remember that. And Claudia said, well, why didn't we talk about it? And her mom said, you know, I have no idea. So they didn't even talk about it. I think in some of these cases, there is amnesia that is imposed upon the witnesses. Uh, and perhaps this is more than just a simple sighting. Well, I mean, certainly it is if there's amnesia problems. But as far as anyone being abducted, I don't have direct evidence of any missing time or anything like that, but it's certainly a possibility. Uh, next case I'd like to talk about took place at the Winnipeg Airliner Drive-In Theater. It was also called the Airport Drive-In Theater. This was on July 7th, 1973, when a young dating couple observed a uh, object that they described as having a brassy appearance, a metallic sort of brass-like appearance, and it appeared directly above the theater, maybe 100 feet above it. And it arrived just as the movie began. Uh, they jumped out of the car and looked at this thing, and it quickly disappeared, blending off into the darkness. Uh, they ended re up reporting this, uh, and were told by police officers that what they saw was probably the Champs Chicken advertising balloon, uh, which they totally disagreed with. Uh, it was clear to them that this was a metallic object, and uh, they believe it was a UFO. Another very interesting case took place uh, in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the witness doesn't actually name the theater itself, uh, but it took place in Fort Lauderdale in Florida in 1973. And he was at the theater with his girlfriend when this object appeared, and it was a classic flying saucer. Uh, how he noticed it was suddenly the pr person in the projection booth made an announcement. He said, hey, everybody, look. There's a UFO hovering over the theater. This is not a hoax. It's a UFO. Look. And the witness looked up, and sure enough, there was this metallic saucer. It had lights on it. It had portholes, and through the portholes, he could see humanoid figures. He wasn't able to tell whether these were regular people or uh, unusual in any way, because all he could see was a silhouette but it was clear that there were people inside this thing looking down at them. And this object started circling the theater several times at a very low level. Everybody saw it. He tried to get his girlfriend to see it, but she was too frightened, and she hid down underneath the car seat and refused to look at it. And finally, this object did move off, but at some point, the witness says, uh, military vehicles showed up, shut down the movie, and made everyone leave and told them not to talk about it. I wasn't able to verify this. Uh, this was a case that I found third hand. However, it does fit the pattern we've seen in many of these other cases where these objects hover at very low levels. Another very interesting case occurred in Hinesville, Georgia to an army ranger by the name of Derek Smith. Uh, he and his wife often enjoyed going to the drive-in theater in Hinesville, Georgia. And uh, they were at the theater one e evening when they saw a strange light behind the theater. Uh, his wife pointed it out to him, and they both watched this weird saucer-shaped object send down a beam of light. And as they watched, Inside this beam of light, they could see a humanoid figure being pulled up 
into it. And after this humanoid figure was pulled up into this object, the object darted off. Well, they decided to leave the theater and see if they could find this object or see any more evidence of it. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, they didn't see anything. Uh, but it's one of, I think, the only case really that I could find involving what appears to be an abduction of some kind. Uh, and what's very strange is no one else at the theater seemed to notice it in this case, uh, which is definitely unusual. In most cases, everyone in the theater notices it. So now I'd like to talk about probably the ultimate case of this kind. I talked to the witness firsthand. Uh, his name is Scott Santa, and he was visiting the Ascot Park Drive-In in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, in August of 1974. Uh, he was with his friend. He was just a young man at the time, and uh, they were watching the movie. He doesn't really remember what the movie was, uh, but we're watching this movie when suddenly this object appears. It was came from behind the screen, right above it, uh, barely cleared the screen itself. It was that low, and it was huge. It was a huge boomerang-shaped object, flat black. There was no lights on it, and it came and it moved directly over the screen and over the parking lot itself, at which point all electricity in the entire movie theater, driving movie theater, went out. The movie went black, the snack stand lights went black, all lights around the theater went completely black, and there was this low thrumming noise, uh, but otherwise silent. They got out of their car, they looked at this thing. Uh, Scott says his ears actually popped as this thing moved overhead. Uh, it was t just total silence kind of fell over the theater, what we now know as the Oz effect. Everyone seemed almost zombified, is, is how Scott put it, totally entranced, and just stared at this thing, which didn't appear to stop. It just moved at a very slow pace, 5, 10 miles per hour, low enough where he probably could have taken a rock and hit it, is how he described it. It was very low. And just moves over the theater, and finally moves off, away over the parking lot, and starts to move out of view, and once it finally leaves the premises, suddenly all the electricity came back on at once, as if a switch was flipped. The movie started, the snack stand lights came back on, everything just powered on, at which point everyone strangely just got back into their cars and continued to watch the movie, including Scott himself. Uh, and like everyone else, he apparently just forgot about the sighting, which sounds strange. It sounds counterintuitive, but this is what we see in these cases sometimes, is this weird amnesia effect. Scott remembers visiting the restroom, the snack stand after this, but there was no talk of this incredible UFO sighting. It had completely left his mind, and nobody was talking about it. And... Uh, it was a couple of years later uh, was when he was in a bookstore and saw this book, uh, Unidentified Flying Object by Edward J. Ruppelt, uh, who headed Project Blue Book. And uh, suddenly, as if on cue, his memory came flooding back in of this very peculiar incident at the Ascot Park drive-in. And uh, he remembered it all at once and just flooded right back into his uh, mind. And uh, this is a really good example of how there can be weird amnesia effects. Unfortunately, he was no longer in touch with his friend and he had no one else to ask because uh, he didn't know anyone else who was at the theater. So he's sort of been alone with this. Uh, he did report his case to Ryan Sprague, who included it in his book, Somewhere in the Skies. So this is one case that was published in a UFO book, uh, but it's an amazing case, and it shows how there can be very peculiar effects. Uh, this could be a close encounter, not I mean at least of the second kind, but possibly the third. 
Uh, Scott has considered the possibility that there was missing time or perhaps a mass abduction. He has no direct evidence of this and as of this point has not gone under hypnosis or anything like this. But it's definitely one case of several that seem to have levels of mystery that have yet to be answered. So these cases can be very highly dramatic, such as what happened on June 15, 1975, at the Portland Twin Theater in Scarborough, Maine. This object approached the theater. It started uh, from a distance, moved over to the local shopping center, uh, which is where the witness first saw it. It was at a very low level at this point, 50 feet, maybe 75 feet overhead and it moved behind the movie screen, turned, and hovered 15 feet directly above it. At this point, panic reigned. The theater, which had been filled with cars, quickly emptied. People did not even bother to detach the little attachable speakers. They just drove off in a complete panic until there was about 10 cars remaining, including the witness. And once this object had cleared out the parking lot, remember, this was a twin theater. It rose up, went over to the other screen, parked above it, and cleared out that parking lot. So you can't tell me that it's not doing this on purpose, that it's not showing itself off when it so clearly is. And just judging by its behavior, it wants to be seen. In some cases, people do react in panic, which is what happened in this case. Uh, here's a case which shows uh, government interference. Uh, this occurred in Belleville, Illinois in October 1975. The movie was Last Tango in Paris, and uh, suddenly everyone stopped watching the movie because two objects appeared and started darting around and putting on a display. And in fact, the display was so dramatic and long-lasting that the theater owners finally turned off the movie because it was obstructing people's view and they, no one was watching it and they wanted to see these UFOs darting around. More than 100 people got out of their cars and watched these objects dart around until finally military jets appeared and chased the objects off. This next case is one of the cases that really got me wondering, okay, our theater's being targeted. And it was one of the cases that made me decide to investigate this subject more deeply. This occurred in July of 1976 over Denver, Colorado at the Mile High Theater. The movie was Dr. Zhivago. Suddenly this metallic craft shows up. It's got colored lights on it, and this object comes right next to the screen, stops and hovers there, and suddenly it extends this weird sort of device out of the bottom of the craft, which starts flashing super bright lights. They were so bright that the witness said you couldn't actually look at them. As the witness says, and I quote, everyone there saw a huge flying saucer rising up behind and somewhat to the left of the screen. Everyone got out of their cars and watched as this thing slowly rose then came to a complete standstill hovering. Finally, it tilted at a 45 degree angle and darted away. Uh, so yeah, the 1970s is when th these sightings really got dramatic. Uh, another case I'd like to talk about occurred at the Riverside Drive-In. This is in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania. This occurred sometime during the 1970s. Date is unknown. But the main witness, Joseph, says, and I quote, I spotted something moving across the sky. It would move left, then right, then up and down. Then all of a sudden it shot straight up and out of sight. It wasn't a plane, that's for sure. So again, there's that weird behavior where it's putting on a show for the witnesses. Uh, here's another case from Colorado. Uh, this occurred in Boulder, Colorado in July of 1976 when this object uh, was visible off in the distance and was moving in this sort of weird winding, meandering course back and forth. 
uh, but making pretty much a direct line towards the theater. And as soon as it got close to the theater, it made a beeline for the theater as if it was attracted to it, which it clearly was because it stops and it hovered 200 feet over the theater. This was, quote, a classic domed saucer. Uh, it flashed lights that were too bright to look at. Uh, it was almost painful, the witness said, to look at these lights. And people in the audience reacted by honking their horns and flashing their headlights back at the object, uh, which does happen in a few cases. And at this point, the object darts off and moves away. Uh, here's another interesting case uh, which occurred at the Yuma Drive-In. Uh, this was in September of 1976. Remember, the Yuma Drive-In had been visited twice before already. Uh, so this is probably one of the more uh, most visited drive-in theaters. Uh, usually these drive-in theaters are targeted once, as near as I can tell, but that's not always the case. Uh, the Yuma Drive-In has had at least three encounters. This one was investigated by uh, Roger Marsh of MUFON, and uh, it was seen by an entire family. Uh, and this object was off in the distance at first, but kept getting closer and closer, and was in view for about 30 minutes, when suddenly it came directly over the theater and right over the audience itself. It was a classic saucer, metallic, sort of gold-colored, with lights or perhaps portholes. And as it moved over the theater, it began wobbling and doing flip-flops. And finally, it just moved off. But again, there you go. I'm telling you, it's putting on a show for witnesses. If you want to see a UFO, go to the local drive-in. Here's another great case. This occurred at the Twin Drive-In, and this is in downtown Stockton, a very urban area. June 10th, 1977, the movie was King Kong, and the movie had just began. This is how this often happens in cases. The UFO will show up when the movie begins or during an intermission or during a really exciting part. So the movie had just begun when uh, people at the theater saw this object approaching and it came right over the theater. The witness's estimate was about 200 feet high, it was totally silent, it was saucer shaped, it had rotating white lights around the perimeter. Uh, one of the witnesses exited the car and watched this thing. Uh, and he was an Army National Guard officer, so a trained witness, and he just watched it hover over the theater and then move off. Uh, he is absolutely convinced, as is his family, that this was a genuine UFO. So almost all of these have occurred in the United States. A few occurred in Canada, but there is one very interesting case which occurred in China. This was not a drive-in theater per se. This was an outdoor theater, uh, which had a capacity to hold an audience of 3,000 people. This, on July 7th, 1977, more than 3,000 people were watching the movie Beyond the Blue Danube uh, when two glowing objects showed up. They were very bright, cigar-shaped, almost fiery in appearance, and came swooping down over this crowd of 3,000 people in a clear display to announce their presence. In fact, they came so low, some people thought they would crash, and people could feel the heat from these objects. So in this case, the consequences were tragic. It caused a complete panic, and everyone scattered, and as a result, more than 300 people were injured, some very severely, and two children were trampled to death. So if the UFOs are trying to put on a little friendly display, in some cases they clearly misjudged how people would react, uh, as in this case, which caused quite a furor. Uh, officials tried to call it an illusion or an optical effect, but after they replayed the movie several times, there was no repeat appearance. So... The witnesses, uh, to them, it was very clear that these objects were real. They came down very low, and again, they could actually feel the heat. So this is something that's affecting the environment and would be 
classified as a close encounter of the second kind. So I've just got a few more cases I'd like to show, share with you. Uh, this next case occurred around 1978 or so. The name of the theater is unknown, but it occurred at, in Federal Way, Washington, when suddenly everyone noticed that the screen started to go fuzzy. Everyone was surprised to see this huge object hovering over the theater itself, right over the screen, which was all, become all wavy and fuzzy, at which point everyone started honking their horns. This was a large object. The witness says it was encircled with lights. It hovered very briefly for just about 30 seconds and then darted away. But again, it's an important case because it's one of just a few in which there were actual electromagnetic effects. Here's another interesting case which occurred at the Century 4 drive-in in Grand Prairie, Texas on May 7, 1978. The movie was Beyond and Back, which is a paranormal movie about near-death experiences. Uh, this was a very large theater, uh, four screens with capacity for 2,000 cars, when suddenly cars started flashing their headlights and honking, and people were jumping out, and this is when the witness noticed this huge object hovering overhead. It was very large, it was triangular-shaped, the witness estimated it was about three football fields wide, and it hovered at a very low level directly over this uh, huge drive-in movie theater for just a few moments, and then it darted straight upwards and took on a star-like appearance where it remained for the entire duration of the movie. So again, perhaps in some cases they are watching the movie, but I think no, in most cases they're just trying to show off. Um, here's another case that affected the movie itself. This was in July of 1978 at the Blue Ridge Drive-In Theater in Sailorsburg, Pennsylvania. Suddenly the speaker is filled with static and this object passes right low over the theater. It's making a low humming noise. The picture on the, the screen became badly distorted and uh, this object finally just moves off and everything goes back to normal, except for half of the people who have been watching the movie decided that they were, were no longer <laughs> interested in watching the movie or staying there, and they took off and vacated the premises. Another amazing case, 1978. This occurred at the Albion Drive-In in Albion, Michigan. The main witness, uh, Nick is his name, saw this UFO hovering over a tree in a field next to the drive-in theater. He was at the theater with his brother and he pointed it out and, uh, and said, hey look, what's that? And his brother said, oh, that's just a helicopter. But just immediately did a double take because it was clearly not a helicopter. This thing was silent. It was a disc, it was sort of this glowing disc. Everyone at this point could see it. They stopped watching the movie and watched this UFO, including the employees of the theater. And it hovered there for just a few moments and finally moved quickly upward, higher and higher until it was just a white, tiny little dot and it disappeared into outer space. But an, another amazing case. So at this point, you can see that these theaters are being targeted. And if you don't think so, well, I can always march out another case. Uh, April 14th, 1979 the Southwest Twin Drive-In Theater in Memphis, Tennessee. The witness uh, noticed people getting out of their cars and exiting and looking up. So he did the same and could see four red objects in a diamond formation hovering over the theater. They hovered there for, I mean, he only got to watch it for just a few minutes. Uh, perhaps they were there longer than he knew. Uh, at any rate, uh, he, after a few minutes, all four objects each moved off, each in a completely opposite, different direction. So many, many cases. Just a few more, if you'll indulge me. Uh, April, uh, or the next case I'd like to talk about, occurred at the Fountain Valley Drive-In 
1980, this is in Fountain Valley, California, two objects appeared right above the screen like they always do. Then they started darting and stopping and shooting upwards. At this point, the power in the theater and the surrounding area went out. And everyone still remained hoping the power would come back on, which after 10 minutes, it did come back on. And they restarted the movie, at which point the lights dropped down again and started darting around and uh, shooting off. And the power went out again, and this time it did not come back on. Uh, whether the UFOs caused this, we can't say for sure, but given that there are so many accounts involving UFO-related power outages, it looks like that's what happened in this case. At any rate, uh, the audience had to leave and were sent home. <clears throat> okay, the next case I want to talk about uh, also occurred in the 1980s. This was at the Edgewood Theater in Baldwin Park when a craft hovered for about two minutes right at the upper right corner of the screen. The theater was uh, completely full, but uh, many people left uh, following this, and uh, the witness uh, later reported his sighting uh, on the internet in hopes of finding other witnesses. And he told his story, and a couple of years later, he did find another witness who said, uh, gave a description exactly what the first witness said. Said that this object hovered right out the corner of the screen, and about 70 to 80 percent of the people left. Everyone was freaking out. There was no way it was a helicopter because this object was totally silent. So, yeah, many, many cases. Uh, here's another one which occurred at the Wilmington Drive in Theater in Ohio. This was in the summer of 2004, a fairly recent case. And a brilliant light appeared right above the theater and uh, they thought it might be a plane at first because it was just moving in a straight line when suddenly it uh, shot straight upwards and uh, remained in place uh, as a star-like object for the rest of the night. So again, perhaps in some cases they are watching the movie. Uh, another modern case uh, occurred uh, in 2008 or so. This was at the Autorama Theater in North Ridgefield, Ohio. And as the movie began, five to six objects appeared right above the movie screen. Then they moved behind the screen and then to the left of it, everyone started talking. A few people did have uh, cell phones and tried to take pictures, uh, but it, Apparently they did not come out because the lights faded quickly away. Uh, another recent case occurred in 2014 at the Mansfield Drive-In Theater in Mansfield, Connecticut. This was on August 10th, 2014. The movie was Guardians of the Galaxy. Again, the witnesses tried to film the object, but as soon as they pulled their camera out, this object swooped off. A uh, very recent case occurred in 2015 at the Tuscosa Drive-In in Amarillo, Texas. The main witness is Dee. She was there with her family when this red glowing object appeared overhead and started darting up and dropping down right above the theater. And after it did this several times, they realized how unusual this was. They couldn't see, watch the movie anymore. They were too entranced by this thing. And she quickly whipped out her cell phone and... Uh, tried to take film of this, but it did not appear on the film, unfortunately. So there is a quick, uh, well, not quick, <laughs> there's a wrap-up of all these cases. Uh, pretty incredible. I think it's clear by now that these objects are targeting theaters. Uh, they're clearly putting on a display. Uh, and uh, there's just case after case of this. And uh, I've, there are even more recent ones. I mean, the most recent case, I think, was 2019. I've got one from 2017. Uh, it's clear to me that these are 
purposefully and intentionally showing themselves off to a captive audience. And I think, you know, I did uh, look into the possibility that they're watching these movies. I don't think that's what's going on here. Uh, perhaps they're studying the, our emotions as we're watching the movie. I, that, perhaps that's possible. But just judging from their very dramatic uh, behavior where they put on shows and release smaller objects and flash their lights and send beams of light on the screen and this sort of thing, I think they're showing themselves off on purpose. I've got no direct evidence of people being abducted, but entirely possible that in a few of these cases there were mass abductions. Most of these cases you could probably categorize as close encounters of the first kind. As we have seen, several are sec close encounters of the second or third kind. But in reality, I think you could accurately classify 100% of these cases as close encounters of the fifth kind, and by that I mean human-initiated encounters. Uh, because it's clear to me that these objects are being attracted by uh, the drive-in theater. These are initiated as a result of human action. Uh, so yeah, perhaps these are actually all close encounters of the fifth kind. At any rate, this is definitely a thing. This is a very peculiar type of behavior that a lot of people don't know about. <laughs> And I think it's important that they do. And if you want to see a UFO, if you want to call down a UFO, a really good place to start might be at a drive-in theater. Just saying. Because I've documented more than 100 cases of this kind, uh, which I've written about in my book, UFOs at the drive-in. Since then, I've gotten a number of other cases just... Last week, I was contacted by a gentleman who had a very dramatic sighting with his family where a UFO showed up right next to the theater and actually caused the screen to melt. The, the film in the projection booth melted away and it caused a panic and everyone left the theater. So yeah, this is a very dramatic uh, type of event that I think takes place a lot more often than the 100 cases I've presented in this book. And it's a very effective method for UFOs to announce their presence. Because if you do the math, I mean, if they're, let's say the average audience is about 500 people, and uh, if you have 100 cases involving 500 people, well, what's that? I mean, 50,000 people? At, and... That's just the cases we have in this book alone. The truth is, most people don't report their cases. So I'm guessing there's 10 times more than that, if not 100 times. So we could be looking at as many as 5 million people, perhaps, or more, who have seen UFOs at drive-in theaters. And I know that it sounds like a lot, but uh, this is definitely uh, a thing. <laughs> this is definitely what's happening. And given the fact that this has been occurring for more than 70 years, I'm fairly confident in saying that there will be more cases that will continue to occur over drive-in theaters. So that's this episode for uh, today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Once again, thank, for, thank you for watching and keep having fun.